Hey there friends, this is Sean McGeever here and I am doing a Talk Tuesday, how to do a Young Life Talk through the Gospel of Luke and this week is Luke 24. It's the last chapter of Luke. Uh, it's been exciting. Um, also looking forward to wrapping it up and so here we go. Uh, Luke 24 is Luke's final chapter of his Gospel, uh, Luke. But really, just as a heads up for those of us who are preparing talks, we really need to know that Luke is really only volume one of what Luke has to say about everything that Jesus did. Because when we look in Acts 1-1, we see, um, and Acts is written by, um, is written by Luke um, to the same person, Theophilus, uh, that uh, he says in Acts 1-1 that uh, his previous gospel was only the beginning of all that uh, Jesus began to do, and the Acts is now the continuation. So anyway, um, though we're in Luke 24, uh, you really got to keep reading Acts 1 and 2. I really suggest you do that if you're preparing a talk. I've actually thought about doing that in my club, like in the fall, going through the gospel of Luke as much as possible, and then in the spring, uh, going through Acts and talk about everything that Jesus continued to do, uh, that God continued to do. I haven't done that yet, but I've, I've thought about that. Um, but here's one thing about Luke 24, is it just kind of gives a foreshadow of what the fullness of the gospel is. Um, certainly we hear about the resurrection and we, he ascends into heaven, but it's also, there's some hints in here about the foreshadowing, about the giving of the spirit, about um, wait uh, until you're clothed upon high uh, with power. And uh, you read about that in verse 49, uh, until you're clothed with power from on high. And so you have to go to Luke, I'm sorry, you have to go to Acts uh, chapter one and two there to see the power of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, it's a great study to just look at kind of the character of the, of the especially the, the disciples, um, what they're like in Luke's gospel compared to what they're like in Acts. I mean, they're really truly changed men after the Holy Spirit comes into their lives. So anyway, um, there's a lot there. Um, when I've spoke at, at summer camps, I have a little bit more time to develop this. I spent a lot of time in the last two days going through all that. Um, but we're just going to stick to Luke 24 here. Um, this is a fantastic uh, passage. One thing is when you look through the entire chapter, you see that the disciples, those who had been with him, uh, for a very long time are still doubting and have fear and they're not in good shape. And I just want to kind of pass along there that um, if you uh, have friends, uh, teenage friends or leader friends or anyone um, who are experiencing the same thing, consistent confusion, um, doubt, they're really not all in or totally getting Jesus, that that is okay. Um, not only is that okay, but Jesus still um, uh, tells them and proclaims that they even need to tell others that uh, they're to repent um, and so that they can uh, repent for the forgiveness of sins. So even when people still have doubt or don't have it all figured out, you can still call people to follow Jesus. Um, there would never actually be a day, at least I'm not there yet, where all my questions are answered. And so we can extend an invitation even to those who are in process or are doubting or might in some ways uh, feel a, a bit far away. Um, that's just how God works. So anyway, um, yeah, there we go. So, uh, you know, there's quite a bit in this chapter here. There's basically the resurrection story in the first 12 verses. Then there's the walk to Emmaus or on the road to Emmaus, which is uh, actually the majority of the chapter. Um, you can't really do it all on a club talk. And so I, while that's a wonderful story, maybe you talk about it in campaigners or something uh, for a club talk, I think I would stick to the first uh, section, the first 12 verses, and then I would uh, pick it up in verse 36 and go from there to the end. Uh, in the first 12 verses there, you see that the women go to the tomb um, and the, the women, when they go to the tomb, there's no body, um, but there are two um, uh, angels who are there. And then uh, the women go to tell others, but they're not believed. And so Peter goes to check it out himself. Um, so then I would skip past the walk to Emmaus part and talk about when Jesus appears. In verse 26, he comes with this great word, which is peace. Um, when he does that, though, as you look at all the emotions and responses, um, people are troubled and they're doubting. They have disbelief, but also they have joy and they're marveling. There's really a kind of a you know, combination of things going on there. And, and honestly, that is pretty normal when people step into um, knowing more and more about God and knowing more about Jesus. Um, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of questions, but there's also a joy um, and an excitement that comes uh, when God is working. So uh, 
in verse 46 is really in uh, 46 and uh, 40 through 49 is really a spot to I would slow down in your club talk and try to break it down carefully. Um, this is where it is kind of the purpose of Jesus' suffering, um, his death, and his resurrection. It is that repentance uh, for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all nations. And so really kind of the, give that challenge. Um, do you want to uh, repent of your sins um, and so that you can uh, receive that forgiveness? So uh, there's that. And then also 49 uh, which I already mentioned there, it, said, uh, it says, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. Stay in the city until you're clothed in power from on high. I mean, talk about a cliffhanger. He says, stay here. Don't do anything. Don't try to do anything on your own until, until what? Um, until you're clothed with power and on, on, on high. And you have to go into Acts to see how that plays out. Um, but, I mean, it's just another great word, whether it's for club or for campaigners. Uh, Jesus did not want them to try to follow him on their own, through their own power. Uh, impossible. Um, really, when you look and read further in Acts, it's only possible when the Holy Spirit came into their life and empowered them to be able to live a life that they could have never lived on, uh, through their own power, capacity, trying hard enough, any of that. That was the game changer. Um, and then Jesus ascends into heaven. Uh, I've actually been preaching this and teaching this more and more in my club and certainly at camps when I've been able to speak about it. And I think really the way to frame the ascension is to go, wait, wouldn't it be better if Jesus was here? Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could kind of go find him somewhere? Maybe he's in the Middle East, maybe wherever, who knows? And you go, no, that actually wasn't God's plan. Jesus left on purpose. And, and the purpose is he didn't want to just be located to one place in time like he was on earth for those years, um, 2,000 years ago. He ascended into heaven so that he could actually send his spirit so that Christians could actually be filled from the inside out. They wouldn't have to go and find a person. Um, God would actually want to come and live inside of them. Anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there, but um, I think the ascension is the perfect setup to say, well, wait, wouldn't it be better if Jesus was here? No. And we learn actually in John, if you go back and read John 14 and 16, it's better that I go away. Because if I do go away, I'll send um, my advocate, I'll send the spirit. So there's a couple main points you could dig into here. First off is that Jesus conquered death, um, just as he said that he would do, um, so that we can have eternal life now and forever. It's not just life then, one day, maybe after we die, but Jesus wants to give us eternal life, a brand new kind of life now. Um, another main point is just plain and simple. Do you want to follow Jesus? Um, align your life with Jesus's plan for your life. Begin following him. Repent and say, I want to go your way um, uh, with my life, God. Another one is that, uh, another main point is that death is not the end of our experience. Life continues after death and Jesus wants us to join him. What does this show us about Jesus? Well, Jesus is God. The resurrection is the ultimate miracle uh, to show a sign that he is God. Sure, maybe he healed someone. Maybe he did a trick or something. I mean, maybe there's skeptics out there. Um, but Jesus conquered death. This is the ultimate sign. Um, earlier, um, when the uh, you know uh, Pharisees and such are, are, are trying to say, you know, do a sign for us, do a sign for us, they actually say, no sign will be given to you except for the sign of Jonah. And when he's talking about the sign of Jonah, he's actually talking about the resurrection, right? Three three uh, days in the belly of a whale. Well, three three days um, in the tomb, and he comes out and he says, if you want. If you want a miracle, I'm going to give you a miracle. When I've done that one, uh, that should be more than enough, uh, raising from the dead. So anyway, Jesus conquered death. Another uh, thing that we learn about Jesus is that he wants us to repent of our sins and follow him. That's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to follow him. Another thing that we learn about Jesus is that Jesus left and ascended um, from earth because he wants to fill us with his spirit. And if you want to include that, you can look in Acts uh, 2, verse 37 and 38, if you just want to read it. What does this have to do with our life? Um, I think there's a strong element in here. Um, there's a lot of doubt when it comes to humans. When you look, at, especially at the guys, and the women actually come out pretty good on this uh, in this chapter, um, but the guys are really doubting. And so I think, um, what does this tell us about our life? It tells us that many of us remain skeptics, and we need proof. Um, some disciples, even after they saw Jesus, still doubted. Um, and that's okay. It's still okay to um, take the next steps with Jesus and even repent and give your life to Jesus when you still don't have all your questions asked. Um, that's just kind of how God works sometimes. Another one is that we all fear death. Um, uh, we just do. <laughs> um, and with Christ, we have so much to look forward to after death. Um, we have so much to look forward to, and that changes our outlook on eternity. I'll give a couple technical uh, nuggets and then a couple illustrations, and then we're done with Luke. 
Um, first off, in verse one, it talks about the. It says at the first day of the week, at the early dawn. What's this first day of the week talk? Well, the Jewish calendar um, actually mirrors the seven days of creation. And so the Sabbath um, is the day of rest. So that's the seventh day. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to rest on the seventh day. And so the Sabbath, which is a Saturday for our Jewish friends, um, is on a Saturday. And so we know that Jesus resurrected on a Sunday, on Sunday morning. And so actually the way that this works, it's really quite beautiful, is it's really the first day of new creation. It's a, it's like the eighth day. It's really wonderful and powerful. Um, you don't need to explain all that, but and in fact, that's why Christians worship on Sunday. It's only the resurrection day. It's the day of new life. It represents everything that Jesus wants to do for us. Um, and so Anyway, there's there's that, just a little background on why it's important it's the first day of the week. Um, another little nugget is that uh, women are a big part of the story. And it's interesting on um, a couple fronts. One is that in ancient uh, times, um, w in the ancient world, women were not credible witnesses. They couldn't uh, testify in court. Um, they just weren't credible witnesses. So, so two things. One is that... Uh, this shows the historicity of the story. If Luke was trying to compile a story that sounded convincing, a lot of people would buy into, he would never pick women to be the first witnesses of Jesus not being there. Um, and so you would never write a story this way to convince an audience. So that we know that since he wrote it the other way, um, he's telling the truth. So there's one aspect there, but maybe more importantly, the women are the first uh, witnesses that Jesus is not in the tomb and that Jesus is resurrected. Um, they are the first evangelists to go and proclaim that Jesus is resurrected, just as he said. Um, they're also in this story, in this chapter, they're they're really not doubting or, you know, unbelief. Like they kind of buy in really quick. Um, this chapter gives us a really strong view of, of the role of women in, in the Christian church, in the early Christian church, um, and their priority, to be honest. And so um, this is just an aspect of how the gospel prioritizes those who are normally overlooked. Um, and um, I think we should take that to heart and, and maybe highlight that, um, if not just know it for ourselves. Another thing um, is in verse uh, 6 and 7, uh, he mentions here, he says, Remember uh, remember how I told you um, while I was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and will be crucified on the third day and rise. Well, anyway, if you look back in Luke's gospel, um, you can see that Jesus had been talking all along that this was going to happen, that he was going to resurrect um, in verse uh, chapter 9, verse 22, in chapter 15, verse 24, in uh, and 32, in chapter 16, verse 31, in chapter 17, uh, verse 25, in chapter 18, verse 32 and 33, Jesus is saying like, look, I'm I'm going to die. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to, but I'm going to raise from the dead. And so um, he had said, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, he basically, he called a shot. Um, he proved it. This is what he did. Um, I ran a bit here, but uh, in verse 11, it said that they had told an, uh, the words of the women when they came and told the disciples. It seemed like an idle tale. It's just like bizarre word that's actually never used in the New Testament, um, except here, but it's used in other places in ancient literature. And it, it just means um, like uh, nonsense talk. It was actually a technical medical term for someone who was like delirious because they're in like the last pains of death, like when they're just talking nonsense. Um, so essentially the men just thought that these women were completely insane and didn't believe uh, the women at all. Um, and then the last part, a little technical uh, bit, uh, would be in verse 47 there, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Just what is this idea of repentance? What does that really mean? Well, repentance, uh, metanoia means a change um, or afterthought about what you think after something. It means to how you change your mind, actually. And uh, so it, it's this radical uh, reorientation of what you believe and what you think. But it isn't only that. It's it's a type of belief and type of thinking, uh, change that happens in your thinking that actually motivates you to want to change. Um, and so it's a realignment of your life, um, your dispositions, your behavior to God's purposes um, when pre uh, previously we were focused on our own purposes and carried out our own desires. It's reorienting orienting and turning to God's ways rather than our ways. That's what repentance is. Um, here's a couple of illustrations and then I'll wrap it up. Um, but one illustration could just be simply uh, that when the women went in and then later when Peter went in, in verse 12, uh, they saw the linen 
cloth on the ground. As you know, I'm pretty big on like finding like objects that are actually in the story. So this is just a pillow cover, but you could have a big pillow sheet or a bed sheet or something and just have it on the ground. And so, you know, when they went in to find Jesus, they didn't see him there. All they found was, was what happened to him? Where is he? So just to highlight the story, maybe bring the story to life a little bit, you could just have a sheet of some sort. Um, two other ideas that are a little bit more kind of figurative, but they could uh, work would be the idea of life and death. Now, I know this is... Um, you know, a, a difficult uh, topic that we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, respectful. And um, certainly in any crowd, there's probably some people who have, um, you know, struggled and have loved ones are dying or have died or maybe, anyway, there's a lot going on there. However, um, Jesus really does want us to engage with that, that new life is possible after death. And so one idea would be to take either a flower or actually I just went out and grabbed a branch from a tree that's outside of my house. Um, from my, my own tree. <laughs> I didn't like steal a tree. Um, but I just, I kind of broke it off, you know, here. And I could just say, hey, you know, look at this, look at this little branch here. Um, it's full of life. But um, as you can see here, it's no longer connected uh, to, to, to the actual tree itself. I mean, it kind of goes back to John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Um, but what will happen here is while this looks great and healthy and it's kind of vibrant right now, um, give it a week, give it a month, give it a year and what you'll notice is that it's not as full of life as originally was. And we are just like that. Whether it's gonna be now or later, um, that day is coming for all of us. But here's the thing, while, while uh, like this branch here, it's kind of withering away, maybe perhaps really slowly, um, God wants us to reconnect and be able to have eternal life, to have life after life, uh, life after death after life. And um, we can do that as we come to Jesus. He conquered death so that we, when we turn to him, when we repent and come to him, he wants to give us eternal life, not just later, but also now. He wants us to reconnect with him so that we can thrive and flourish and be who we are called to be. Um, so there's that. Another one would just be like, a, I think I've done this one before, but just a flashlight illustration. You use a flashlight, either it doesn't work or maybe has some batteries that run really low. And you could just say, look, um, this is kind of like our life. While it might work for a while, very bright, it's just going to start dimming and dimming and dimming. And that day is going to come for us all. And God wants to be able to give us eternal life. Maybe brand new batteries, maybe plug it into a wall, but God wants us to thrive. Um, and that's only possible when we turn to him, the author of life. Anyway, there are my ideas. I hope at least uh, there's been a couple things here. I love talking about the resurrection. Um, as I've you know, been a leader for over 20 years, this is actually uh, an area where I've become more and more excited and I think is more and more necessary for us to talk, not only about the wonderful things that Jesus did um, and that he died on a cross. We can never like make enough of that um, continually. I'm finding ways to highlight that. But the idea of the resurrection, uh, the idea that Jesus conquered death and then ascended into heaven and has given us his spirit is something that I've just, uh, I just feel like has been a whole new season of me uh, being able to communicate what the gospel really means to my friends. And I've just loved digging into it. So anyway, thanks for uh, tagging along here. I've now gone through uh, Matthew and uh, Luke and John, I guess maybe, maybe I'll do Mark uh, next year. We'll see, see what the year brings. Um, but it's been really fun. So uh, thanks for hanging in there and I hope you have a great club talks and a great summer. All right, bye.